And Schaefer told the girls that he would be back later to finish the job. Law enforcement officers are entrusted with upholding the principles of justice, and it is imperative that individuals authorized to wield both a firearm and a police badge undergo comprehensive background checks. Unfortunately, lapses in this vetting process have occurred, leading to instances where individuals with criminal tendencies, such as serial killers, have infiltrated the ranks of the police force. Here are seven cops who are serial killers. Gerard John Schaefer. Gerard John Schaefer was born on March 26, 1946, in Nina, Wisconsin. His father, a traveling salesman, and his mother, a housewife, provided the backdrop for a childhood marred by frequent relocations and a tumultuous family life. As a young boy, Schaefer's world was plagued by his father's alcoholism and the verbal abuse he inflicted upon his wife and children. These early experiences left a lasting impact on Schaefer, shaping his troubled psyche and setting the stage for the darkness that would consume him in later years. As a child, Schaefer found solace in the outdoors, developing a keen interest in nature and outdoor pursuits. However, beneath his seemingly innocent exterior, a sinister fascination was brewing. In his teenage years, Schaefer's fantasies took a disturbing turn. He developed an erotic fixation on hurting women and engaged in sadomasochistic rituals. This early fascination with violence and power would become a defining characteristic of his later crimes, but it didn't stop there. Schaefer also developed voyeuristic tendencies, becoming a peeping Tom and invading the privacy of unsuspecting women. This behavior provided him with a twisted sense of satisfaction, fueling his dark desires. Additionally, he began to experiment with cross-dressing, further blurring the lines between fantasy and reality. As Schaefer grew older, his deviant desires intensified. He became fixated on the idea of inflicting pain and suffering upon women, relishing in their vulnerability. These fantasies consumed his thoughts, driving him to explore the depths of his sadistic inclinations. After graduating from St. Thomas Aquinas High School, where he was considered a promising student and participated in in sports, Schaefer briefly worked as a fishing guide before enrolling at Broward Community College. His aspirations led him to Florida Atlantic University, where he hoped to become a teacher. However, fate had a different path in store for him. In 1968, Schaefer married his fiancée, Martha Marty Louise Fogg, but their relationship quickly soured, leading to their divorce in 1970. It was during this tumultuous period that Schaefer's dark desires began to consume him, and he embarked on a career in law enforcement. Schaefer's first foray into law enforcement was as a police officer in Wilton Manors, Florida. However, his performance on the force was less than stellar, and he was ultimately dismissed for misconduct. But this setback didn't deter him. Schaefer saw an opportunity to fulfill his twisted desires within the ranks of the Martin County Sheriff's Department. It was during his time as a deputy that Schaefer's true nature began to reveal itself. In 1972, he abducted two teenage girls, Nancy Ellen Trotter and Paula Sue Wells, and subjected them to a horrifying ordeal that would forever change their lives. Trotter and and Wells were innocent victims, unsuspecting of the danger that lurked behind Schaefer's badge. He bound them to trees with a hangman's noose around their necks, a chilling practice that earned him the moniker Hangman. The girls endured unimaginable torture and sexual assault, their lives hanging by a thread. Miraculously, Trotter and Wells managed to escape their captors' clutches, summoning the strength and courage to break free from the nightmare that had consumed them. Their bravery would ultimately lead to Schaefer's arrest and the subsequent unraveling of his dark secrets. Had these two girls not been made of strong stuff, they would not have lived to tell the story and Schaefer would have never been caught. As investigators delved deeper into Schaefer's activities, they made a horrifying discovery. The bodies of Susan Carroll Place and Georgia Marie Jessup, who had gone missing in 1972, were found near Oak Hammock Park in Port St. Lucie. The remains bore the unmistakable signs of torture and mutilation, confirming the sadistic nature of Schaefer's crimes. Search warrants executed at Schaefer's residences revealed a trove of disturbing evidence, writings detailing his sadistic fantasies, photographs depicting women being hung and mutilated, and personal possessions belonging to missing or murdered individuals painted a chilling picture of the depths of Schaefer's depravity. Schaefer was charged with first-degree murder for the killings of Place and Jessup. Though he pleaded not guilty, the evidence against him was overwhelming. The trial that followed would expose the true extent of his monstrous acts. Witnesses took the stand, recounting the gruesome discoveries of the victims' bodies and the evidence linking Schaefer to the crimes. Nancy Trotter and Paula Wells bravely shared their harrowing experiences, 
providing crucial testimony that would help secure justice for the victims. The jury was presented with photographs, crime scene evidence, and even a manuscript penned by Schaefer himself, detailing his twisted methods of properly executing women. The weight of the evidence left no doubt about Schaefer's guilt. In the end, Schaefer was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. However, his time behind bars would be cut short by a fellow inmate who ended his life in December 1995. With Schaefer's death, the world was spared from further horrors at his hands. Gennady Mikasevich. In the shadowy depths of the Soviet Union, a chilling tale unfolds. Meet Gennady Mikasevich, a man who wore two faces, that of a respected cop and that of a remorseless serial killer. Born on April 7, 1947, in Ist, Vitebsk Oblast, Belarusian SSR, Mikasevich's life took a sinister turn that would shock a nation. Gennady's story is the story of a man who terrorized the streets of Vitebsk, Polotsk, and the surrounding rural areas for over a decade. From his first murder in May 1971, fueled by anger and heartbreak, to his reign of terror that claimed the lives of 36 innocent women, Mikasevich's crimes will leave you astounded. Born on April 7, 1947, in the small town of Ist, Vitebsk Oblast, by Belarusian SSR, Mikasevich's early life seemed unremarkable, but as we will soon discover, appearances can be deceiving. Nestled in the heart of the Soviet Union, Ist was a quiet town, far removed from the chaos of the outside world. Mikasevich grew up in a modest family, his childhood filled with the simple joys of rural life. But beneath the surface, a darkness was brewing, waiting to be unleashed. Like many young men of his time, Mikasevich was conscripted into the Soviet army. It was during his military service that the seeds of his rage and resentment were sown. While he served his country, his girlfriend back home made a fateful decision that would change the course of his life forever. In a letter that arrived at his barracks, Mikasevich learned that his girlfriend had left him and married another man. The news struck him like a thunderbolt, shattering his heart and leaving him consumed by a toxic mix of anger and jealousy. It was in May 1971, fueled by this seething rage, that Mikasevich committed his first act of violence. As he walked along a desolate road, he encountered a young woman, a stranger to him. In a fit of blind fury, he unleashed his pent-up emotions, snuffing out her life without a second thought. This heinous act marked the beginning of Mikasevich's descent into darkness. With each passing day, his thirst for blood grew stronger, and he embarked on a killing spree that would span over a decade. The victims of Mikasevich's wrath were often unsuspecting women chosen at random. He would stalk them, waiting for the perfect moment to strike, and when the time was right, he would pounce, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. As the body count rose, panic gripped the communities of Vitebsk, Polotsk, and the surrounding rural areas. The fear of the unknown hung heavy in the air as residents locked their doors and whispered about the elusive killer in their midst. The authorities were baffled, unable to connect the dots and apprehend the perpetrator, but little did they know that the man they were searching for was hiding in plain sight, wearing the uniform of a cop. It wasn't until the 1980s that a young investigator, with a keen eye for detail, began to notice a pattern in the unsolved cases. The realization that a serial killer was on the loose sent shockwaves through the community, and a renewed sense of urgency gripped the investigation. But Mikasevich, ever the cunning predator, made a fatal mistake. In a desperate attempt to derail the investigation, he sent an anonymous letter to a local newspaper, taunting the authorities and sowing confusion. Little Little did he know that this act of arrogance would be his downfall. Handwriting analysis eventually led the investigators to Mikasevich's doorstep. In December 1985, he was arrested, and the truth behind his reign of terror was finally brought to light. During his trial, Mikasevich's dark secrets were laid bare. He confessed to the murders, leaving the courtroom in a state of shock. The families of his victims finally had some semblance of closure, knowing that the man responsible for their loved one's deaths would face justice. Gennady Mikasevich was convicted of murder with aggravating circumstances and sentenced to to death. On September 25, 1987, at the age of 40, he met his end at Pishalowski Castle in Minsk, Belarusian SSR, executed by shooting. But the story doesn't end there. The shocking truth that emerged during Mikasevich's trial was that several innocent people had been convicted and executed for crimes he had committed. His case exposed corruption within the investigation, casting a dark shadow over the criminal justice system. <laughs> The lives of those wrongly accused and their families were forever shattered, victims of a system that failed them. Gennady Mikasevich's story serves as a haunting reminder of the darkness that can reside within the human soul. Rosemary Ndlovu
In the quiet town of Tembisa, South Africa, a sinister plot was unfolding. It was June of 2013 when Rosemary and Lovu, a former policewoman, invited her sister Audrey over for a seemingly innocent dinner. Little did Audrey know that this would be the last meal she would ever share with her sister. The next day, to the shock of the community, Audrey's lifeless body was discovered in her rented room. The autopsy revealed a horrifying truth. She had been a victim of poisoning and strangulation. The investigation into Audrey's murder would uncover a web of deceit, insurance fraud, and cold-blooded killings. As the investigation into Audrey's murder unfolded, the authorities began to connect the dots and uncover a chilling pattern of death surrounding Rosemary and Lovu. It was revealed that just a few weeks before Audrey's tragic demise, another family member had met a similar fate. Zanelle Mota, Rosemary's niece, was found brutally murdered in June of 2013. The cause of death was determined to be a result of severe beating. It was a shocking and heartbreaking loss for the family, but little did they know that this was just the beginning of a string of horrifying crimes. But the web of deceit and death didn't stop there. In October 2015, Maurice Mabasa, Rosemary's boyfriend and the father of her child, met a gruesome end. His lifeless body was discovered in Oliphant's Fontaine, dumped with over 76 stab wounds. The sheer brutality of the murder sent shockwaves through the community. Maurice, known for his kindness and generosity, had fallen victim to the very person he loved and trusted. The motive behind these heinous acts soon became clear. Rosemary had taken out substantial life insurance policies in the names of her victims ensuring a hefty payout upon their deaths. It was a calculated plan to live off the insurance money, fueling her own selfish desires. The investigation revealed that Rosemary had collected over 131,000 rand in insurance from Morris's death alone. The authorities were now faced with the daunting task of building a case against Rosemary, connecting the dots between the murders and uncovering the extent of her crimes. The evidence was mounting, and the truth was slowly coming to light. The once respected policewoman had turned into a cold-blooded killer, preying on her own family members for financial gain. But justice eventually caught up with Rosemary and Lovu. In 2021, she was sentenced to six concurrent life terms for the murders and an additional 30 years for fraud and incitement charges. Her reign of terror had come to an end, but the scars left on the victims' families would last a lifetime. The case of Rosemary and Lovu serves as a stark reminder of the darkness that can lurk within seemingly ordinary individuals. It is a testament to the dedication and perseverance of law enforcement in bringing justice to those affected by such heinous crimes. Joseph James D. Angelo. And I'm really sorry to everyone I've heard. In the quiet town of Visalia, California, a sinister presence lurked in the shadows. Little did the residents know that their peaceful community would soon become the hunting ground for a man who would later be known as the Visalia Ransacker. Joseph James D'Angelo, a former police officer and mechanic, began his criminal career in the mid-1970s. His early crimes as the Visalia Ransacker were a chilling precursor to the horrors he would unleash in the years to come. The Visalia Ransacker was a master of stealth, striking fear into the hearts of the community. He would break into homes, leaving behind a trail of chaos and terror. His targets were often ordinary families, unaware of the danger that lurked just beyond their front doors. Joseph's modus operandi was to meticulously search through his victims' belongings, taking small items of value and sentimental significance. But his crimes were not limited to Left alone. He would also engage in acts of vandalism, leaving his victims feeling violated and vulnerable. Joseph James's reign of terror was marked by his ability to evade capture. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement, he remained one step ahead, leaving behind little evidence and few leads. The community lived in fear, wondering when and where he would strike next. His crimes escalated over time as he grew bolder and more brazen. His actions left a lasting impact on the community, forever changing the sense of security they once had. It wasn't until years later that the true extent of Joseph's crime crimes would be fully understood. As investigators began to connect the dots, they realized that this elusive burglar was just the beginning of a much darker and more sinister story. As the Visalia Ransacker's reign of terror came to an end, a new and even more sinister persona emerged from the shadows. Joseph James D'Angelo, the former police officer and mechanic, would soon become known as the East Area Rapist when he moved to the Sacramento area. While in the Sacramento area, he would target unsuspecting individuals and couples in their own homes. 
his method of operation was calculated and brutal, leaving a trail of trauma and devastation in his wake. Under the cover of darkness, the East Area rapist would break into homes. Often, while his victims were sleeping, he would bind and gag them, subjecting them to hours of unspeakable horrors. The level of violence and sadism displayed by the East Area rapist was unparalleled. His attacks were marked by his meticulous planning and ability to elude capture. He would taunt his victims and the police through phone calls, leaving them in a constant state of fear and paranoia. The community lived in terror as the East Area rapist struck again and again, seemingly unstoppable. Law enforcement agencies worked tirelessly to catch this elusive predator, but he always managed to slip away, leaving behind a traumatized community in his wake. Joseph's crimes escalated over time as he became more brazen and his attacks more violent. The fear and panic in the Sacramento area reached unprecedented levels as residents took extreme measures to protect themselves from this faceless monster. But despite the community's best efforts, the East Area Rapist continued to elude capture, leaving investigators frustrated and desperate for a breakthrough. It would take years of tireless investigation and advancements in forensic technology before the true identity of the East Area Rapist would be revealed. In 2018, DNA testing confirmed D'Angelo's identity, and he was charged with multiple counts of murder and kidnapping. In 2020, he pleaded guilty to these charges, bringing closure to the victims and their families. The capture and conviction of Joseph James D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, serves as a reminder that evil can hide in plain sight and that justice will prevail. Robert Hansen to understand the twisted path that led Robert Hansen to become a notorious serial killer, we must first delve into his troubled childhood. Born on February 15, 1939, in Esterville, Iowa, Hansen faced numerous challenges from an early age. Growing up, Hansen struggled with shyness, a stutter, and severe acne, which made him an easy target for bullying. These physical and social insecurities left a lasting impact on his psyche, shaping the man he would become. As a young boy, Hansen found solace in the outdoors. He would often escape into the wilderness, seeking refuge from the harsh realities of his daily life. It was during these moments in nature that he developed a fascination with hunting, a passion that would later play a sinister role in his crimes. Despite his difficulties, Hansen managed to graduate from high school and enlisted in the United States Army Reserve in 1957. This experience provided him with a sense of structure and discipline, but it did little to alleviate the deep-rooted insecurities that plagued him. After his military service, Hansen found work as an assistant drill instructor at a police academy. This job, a allowed him to indulge in his fascination with law enforcement and further fueled his desire for power and control. Little did anyone know that behind his seemingly ordinary facade, a dark and twisted mind was brewing. In 1967, he made a fateful decision that would change the course of his life. He packed his bags and moved to Anchorage, Alaska, seeking a fresh start in the last frontier. It was here that he would establish himself as a respected member of the community, all while harboring a sinister secret. In his new surroundings, Hansen's hunting skills earned him a reputation as an expert marksman. He became well-liked by his neighbors and even set hunting records, further solidifying his image as an upstanding citizen. But beneath the surface, a darkness lurked, waiting to be unleashed. As Robert Hansen settled into his new life in Anchorage, Alaska, little did anyone suspect the horrors that were about to unfold. In the early 1970s, Hansen's insatiable thirst for power and control led him down a path of unimaginable darkness. He would become known as the Butcher Baker, a predator who preyed on young women and girls, leaving a trail of terror in his wake. Hansen's modus operandi was as calculated as it was chilling. He would cruise the streets of Anchorage, searching for vulnerable targets. His victims were often prostitutes, young women who were already marginalized and less likely to be missed. Hansen would lure them into his car, promising them money or drugs, and then drive them to his secluded home. Once inside his lair, Hansen would subject his victims to unspeakable horrors. He would bind them, torture them, and rape them, relishing in their fear and helplessness. But his sadistic desires didn't end there. Hansen had a twist game in mind, one that would give him the ultimate thrill. After tormenting his victims, Hansen would release them into the Alaskan wilderness like animals in a sick hunt. Armed with a rifle and a knife, he would give them a head start before pursuing them, enjoying the chase as he closed in on his terrified prey. For Hansen, the act of hunting these women down was a perverse form of entertainment, a way to exert his dominance and control. Tragically, many of these women never stood a chance. The vast and unforgiving Alaskan wilderness became their final resting place as Hansen coldly 
ended their lives. He would bury their bodies in shallow graves, attempting to erase any evidence of his heinous crimes. For years, Hansen's reign of terror went undetected. The disappearances of young women in Anchorage were often dismissed or overlooked, their lives deemed less valuable due to their involvement in sex work. It wasn't until one brave survivor emerged from the clutches of the butcher baker that the truth began to unravel. In 1983, a 17-year-old girl named Cindy Paulson managed to escape Hansen's clutches. She bravely reported her ordeal to the police, providing them with crucial information that would lead to Hansen's capture. Finally, the community of Anchorage could breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that the monster in their midst had been unmasked. He was then sentenced to 461 years without the possibility of parole. He died in prison of natural causes. Dennis Rader Dennis Rader, a former cop who transformed into one of America's most notorious serial killers. Prepare to be horrified as we uncover the chilling details of Rader's reign of terror, from his sadistic fantasies to his brutal murders. Known as the BTK killer, Rader's modus operandi involved binding, torturing, and killing his victims, leaving a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. Dennis Lynn Rader, the man who would later become known as the BTK killer, had a childhood that would foreshadow the darkness that lay within him. Born on March 9, 1945, in Pitt Pittsburgh, Kansas, Rader grew up in Wichita, where he felt ignored and neglected by his parents. This sense of isolation and resentment would shape his twisted path. As Rader entered adulthood, his disturbing tendencies began to surface. He developed sadistic sexual fantasies, finding pleasure in the suffering of others. This sadism manifested itself in his treatment of animals, as he engaged in zoosadism, torturing and killing small creatures. These acts of cruelty were a disturbing precursor to the horrors he would later inflict upon human beings, but Rader's deviant desires didn't stop at animal cruelty. He also indulged in voyeurism, finding pleasure in secretly watching others without their knowledge or consent. This invasion of privacy provided him with a sense of power and control, further fueling his dark fantasies. In addition to voyeurism, Raider explored the dangerous world of autoerotic asphyxiation. This practice involves cutting off one's own oxygen supply during sexual activity to enhance pleasure. It is a risky and potentially deadly behavior that speaks to the depths of Raider's depravity. To further complicate matters, Raider had a fascination with cross-dressing. This blurred the lines between his public persona and his hidden desires, allowing him to explore different facets of his twisted identity. Despite these unsettling inclinations, Raider managed to maintain a seemingly normal life in the community. He held various jobs, including working as an assembler and a security alarm installer. He even got married and had two children, presenting a facade of normalcy that masked the darkness within. However, beneath the surface, Raider's sadistic tendencies continued to grow. The combination of his neglected upbringing, his deviant desires, and his ability to blend into society created a dangerous cocktail that would eventually explode into a reign of terror. Raider's early criminal activities, such as zoosadism, voyeurism, and autoerotic asphyxiation, were a glimpse into the depths of his depravity. These behaviors laid the foundation for the horrors he would later unleash upon the unsuspecting residents of Wichita. The narrative of Raider's upbringing and the development of his disturbing tendencies provide crucial insight into the mind of a man who would become one of America's most notorious serial killers. In in 1974, Dennis Rader's sadistic fantasies escalated into a horrifying reality with the brutal murder of the Otero family. Joseph Otero, his wife Julie, and their two children, Josephine and Joseph Jr., fell victim to Rader's insatiable thirst for power and control. This heinous act marked the beginning of Rader's killing spree and unleashed a reign of terror upon the unsuspecting residents of Wichita. Rader's modus operandi involved binding, torturing, and killing his victims. He reveled in the fear he instilled in his time targets, leaving behind a trail of devastation and shattered lives. Women became his primary targets as he sought to exert dominance and control over them. As Raider continued his killing spree, the community lived in constant fear. The knowledge that a sadistic killer was on the loose sent shockwaves through Wichita. Doors were locked, windows were secured, and a sense of paranoia gripped the city. No one knew who would be next, and the fear of the unknown was suffocating. But Raider didn't stop at the physical act of murder. He wanted the world to know of his heinous acts. He began sending taunting letters to the media, boasting about his crimes and demanding attention. In these chilling correspondences, Raider referred to himself as BTK, which stood for Bind, Torture, Kill, a name that would forever be associated with his reign of terror. The letters contained detailed accounts of his murders, along with keepsakes stolen from his victims. Raider reveled in the fear he instilled in the community, relishing in the power he held over them. The police and media were left scrambling for answers, desperate to bring this sadistic killer to justice. 
The taunting letters added another layer of terror to an already terrified community. Each correspondence was a reminder that Raider was still out there, lurking in the shadows, ready to strike again. The letters fueled the public's fascination with the case and intensified the pressure on law enforcement to capture the elusive BTK killer. However, after not sending the letters for 13 years, Raider started sending the letters again in 2004, which led to his arrest in 2005 and the subsequent guilty plea. Now, he is currently serving 10 concurrent life sentences at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. Russell Williams. He was a killer with the ultimate cover. As a base commander in the Canadian Air Force, Colonel Russell Williams comforted families of the fallen, rubbed shoulders with the Prime Minister, and even flew planes for the Queen. But no one, including his wife, knew that he was also a sexual deviant, burglar, rapist, and murderer. In the quiet town of Bromsgrove, England, on March 7th, 1963, a seemingly ordinary boy named David Russell Williams was born. Little did anyone know that this unassuming child would grow up to become one of Canada's most notorious criminals. Williams's early life appeared to be a charmed one. His family moved to Canada when he was just a young boy, and he settled into a comfortable life in the small town of Chalk River, Ontario. As he grew older, his ambition and drive became evident, setting him on a path that would lead to success and respect. After completing his education, Williams joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, where he quickly distinguished himself as a talented and dedicated individual. His skills as a pilot were unmatched and he soared through the ranks, earning the respect and admiration of his peers. In 2004, Williams achieved a significant milestone in his career when he was appointed as the commander of CFB Trenton, Canada's largest military airbase. This prestigious position not only solidified his status as a respected officer, but also granted him access to high-profile individuals and sensitive information. As a pilot, Williams had the privilege of flying Canadian Forces VIP aircraft, transporting dignitaries and heads of state. His impeccable record and professionalism earned him the trust of those he served, further bolstering his reputation within the military. But behind this facade of success and respectability, a darkness was brewing within Williams. Unbeknownst to his colleagues and loved ones, he harbored a sinister secret that would eventually consume him. While Russell Williams appeared to be a model officer and upstanding member of society, his hidden desires and twisted fantasies were about to be exposed. In the fall of 2009, the peaceful town of Tweed, Ontario, was about to become the epicenter of a terrifying ordeal. It was during this time that a young woman named Jessica Lloyd vanished without a trace, leaving her loved ones and the community in a state of panic. As the days turned into weeks, the search for Jessica intensified, with law enforcement agencies and volunteers working tirelessly to uncover any leads. Unbeknownst to them, the man responsible for Jessica's disappearance was none other than Russell Williams himself. His insatiable appetite for control and power had escalated, leading him to commit heinous acts that would shock the nation. Williams's crimes began with breaking into houses under the cover of darkness, stealing women's and girls' underwear as sick mementos of his twisted desires. But his actions soon escalated to sexual assault, leaving a trail of traumatized victims in his wake. As the investigation into Jessica Lloyd's disappearance continued, a breakthrough came in February 2010. Evidence linked Williams to the crime, and the walls began to close in on the once respected commander. The man who had flown dignitaries and heads of state was now facing the full force of the law. During during his interrogation, Williams confessed not only to Jessica's murder, but also to multiple sexual assaults and other murders. The nation was left in shock as the true extent of his depravity was revealed. The man who had once been seen as a protector had become a predator, preying on the innocent and leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. In October 2010, Williams stood before the court and pleaded guilty to all charges. He was sentenced to two concurrent life sentences, with no possibility of parole for 25 years. His military rank, awards, and privileges was stripped away and he was condemned to spend the rest of his life behind bars. The arrest and conviction of Russell Williams sent shockwaves through the country, leaving a lasting impact on the communities he had terrorized. It served as a stark reminder that evil can hide in plain sight and that even those we trust the most can harbor dark secrets.